I know it's often said, and it might sound um, insincere, but it's true. I am always appreciative for the opportunity to share God's Word, and I mean that. Um, I had a, a friend who also was a professor in college who said, don't ever turn down an opportunity to preach an invitation to share the Word of God. And I, I try to follow that, and I have for 40 years, I guess. Um, and as I approach this opportunity today, it's a very special opportunity because I want to continue a thought that I started last Sunday. This is independent in and of itself, so if you watch or listen to this message live today, um, you don't have to say, well, I, I'm going to be lost. No, because where I'm going to uh, pick up is a story, a passage, a verse that has so much life in and of itself because it is part of the living Word of God. And it's going to speak to you today, but it's been, it's been speaking to me as I've been focusing on it this week. So before we look there, why don't we just prepare our hearts for worship? Why don't we just kind of uh, get our minds where they need to be, make sure that our, our ringers are, are turned off on our phones, and just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the living Word of God, breathing, pulsating, Lord, with life that uh, speaks to us today and infuses us with wisdom. Lord, I speak for everyone in our College Park family today when I say we need to hear from you. And so as we turn to your Word, we thank you that we can hear from you. But even more, Lord, the this, this same Holy Spirit who anointed these words to be written lives in us and can now begin to enliven us and illumine us so that we see with seeing eyes and we hear with hearing ears and we receive not just as the word of men, but we receive your word as it is, the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I began a series, as I mentioned last uh, Sunday, called 23 and 22. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but to begin with, uh, I want to just share something with you that I came across this week. It's one of those humorous things that you laugh at, but you also think about <laughs> because it, it not only is comical, it's convicting. Uh, it's called Eight Signs You're Not Reading Your Bible Enough. Now, we're, we're in uh, the month of March and maybe in January, you made all kinds of commitments and plans and resolutions of what you're going to do in terms of your Bible reading. I don't know how your follow-through has been, but even longer than that, let's go back further than that. In your Christian life, eight signs you're not reading your Bible enough. Number one, the pastor announces the sermon is from Galatians, and you check your table of contents. Number two, you think Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob may have had a few hit songs during the 1960s. <laughs> Number three, you open your Bible to the Gospel of Luke and a World War II savings bond falls out. Wow. Number four, your favorite Old Testament patriarch is Hercules. Number five, signs that you may not be reading your Bible enough. Number five, you become frustrated because Charlton Heston isn't listed in either the concordance or the table of contents. Now, I've got a younger generation that's like, what in the world does that mean? But Charlton Heston, for a lot of us, was Moses in the Ten Commandments long before he landed on the planet of the apes. So that's the frame of reference we're coming from. Number six. Catching the kids reading the Song of Solomon, you demand, who gave you this stuff? Number seven, you keep falling for it every time the pastor tells you to turn in your Bible to first condominiums. And finally, of the eight signs you're not reading your Bible enough, number eight, the number one sign, the kids keep asking too many questions about your usual bedtime story, Jonah the shepherd boy and his ark of many colors. I hope you don't see yourself too much in that story, but I want to seize upon a word in that last point, number eight. The word shepherd. 
shepherd. Let's talk about one of my favorite stories, one of my favorite passages from the Bible. It's Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Now, let me just start by saying we know that God does not change. His attributes are, are familiar to us. He is love. He is holiness. But also, He is uh, omnipotent. He is omnipresent. He is uh, omniscient. He is immutable. We also know that uh, because God does not change, because He is immutable, His Word is absolute truth for all time. So let's just get that established to begin with. I'm not trying to in any way imply that we need to change the Word of God or the Word of God needs to change to keep up with the times. Far from it. But the fact is, we do change. And not just you and I and our limited time here on earth, but I'm talking about people in general change. I mean, think back to generations before us. We don't have to go back very far to see the amazing changes that are taking place in our world, not just in the way we do things, but in the way we think about things. Our culture has changed. So last Sunday, we began talking about how our mental computers, how our God-given thought processes might interpret Psalm 23 in 2022. In other words, how do we do 23 in 22? Maybe it's one of those situations where what's the first thought that comes to your mind? How do you see this immediately when you think about it? Well, by way of review, just to kind of bring everyone up to speed, last Sunday we talked about the first part of verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, in the Hebrew Old Testament, this verse literally began this way. Yahweh is my shepherd. Yahweh, the covenant, the personal name of our Lord. And that's why when I say our Lord, many times you'll see in your Bibles, uh, capital L and then in small caps, O-R-D, and that is always a reference to Yahweh, the, the personal name of God. The only problem is Lord is a title and Yahweh or Yahweh is, is a name. It is the name of our Lord, the personal name of our Lord. According to Dale Ralph Davis in Exodus chapter 3 verses 12 through 15, you don't have to turn there in your Bible, you remember it as the burning bush experience where um, God indicated to a, a shepherd, a shepherd by the name of Moses, that Yahweh was the theological shorthand. I like the way he describes that, the theological shorthand. For I will be present is what I will be. We're more familiar with it as I am that I am. But Davis goes on to write that perhaps the expanded paraphrase of that Statement might correctly be interpreted this way. I will be present with my people to be whatever they need me to be for them. I love that. I will be present with my people to be whatever they need me to be for them. Yahweh is my shepherd. We remember also that the Holy Spirit moved upon a shepherd boy. A shepherd boy by the name of David. And David, the youngest son, that's why he was the shepherd. This was the lowliest task. No one wanted to live with these smelly sheep and to do the same routine things over and over and over and over again every day. And that's why the job fell to him. But David used his time wisely not only to prepare and to learn, but also to worship. And David, the shepherd, wrote a beautiful poem, a beautiful prayer, a beautiful passage, Psalm 23. Martin Luther made this observation. In this single little word, shepherd, Moses the shepherd, David the shepherd, in that single little word, there are gathered together in one, in one, almost all the good and comforting things that we praise in God. Isn't that beautiful? In that Little word shepherd, Martin Luther writes, there are gathered together in one almost 
all the good and comforting things that we praise in God. In other words, that's a powerful word. And so the thought that comes to my mind as I meditate on 23 and 22 is this. The shepherd's shepherd is my shepherd. The shepherd's shepherd is my shepherd. I know we talked about that last week, so I'm going to move on. The next part of verse 1 begins or reads, I shall not want. If the shepherd's shepherd is my shepherd, then I'm in good hands, I would think. He never has to consult with someone about my case, the particulars of my condition. He never needs to read up on my problem. He never has to refer me to a specialist. He'll never shake his head. Never shake his head and say, I'm at a loss. I've never seen a condition like this before. You see, Yahweh is my shepherd, and he knows everything there is to know about sheep. So in my mind, the way I translate this part of verse 23 and 22 is this. Yahweh is a sheepologist, so he specializes in me. So there we are. The shepherd's shepherd is my shepherd. Yahweh is a sheepologist, so he specializes in me. Now, verse 2, where we find ourselves today, brings us to some familiar words that are just as timeless as they are therapeutic. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. I've heard that described as quiet waters, or literally translated translated as waters of rest. He leads me beside waters of rest. To put it another way, Yahweh creates the conditions for my restoration. He puts things in place so I can get well. Now, when I I put these thoughts in my my mental processor, how, how do you think they might have come out? In other words, how do I translate this part of 23 and 22? Well, here's what I came up with. He's the shepherd of my soul. In other words, he's not just my shepherd. But to make it more clear, he is the shepherd of my soul, and he knows the rest of the story. The rest of the story. I told you that that verse literally reads, he leads me by waters of rest. I thought about that word rest, and I thought, you know, R-E-S-T. There's a lot of, of, of powerful words that could be associated with those four letters. But I thought of some words that really explain to me the meaning of this passage. He is a God who shepherds my soul and knows the rest of the story. R stands for resign. Now, What do you mean, Pastor? Well, to begin with, we have to resign as God of the universe because it says, He makes me lie down. In other words, I don't have time to rest. I don't need to rest. I'll rest when it's convenient. No, the Lord is my shepherd, and so He makes me. When He is Lord of my life, I surrender that authority to Him To where I obey, I follow. And when he knows I need to rest, I submit. Well, I have a hard time doing that, Pastor. Then he's not Lord of your life. You have to get to a place where you can say, Lord, as one pastor said, I'm not willing, but I'm willing for you to make me willing. Because it's that important that we allow him to lead us where we need to be, to create the conditions that we need to have, and to even make us to lie down. We resign as God of the universe. I came across an article this week that said something in a way that I'd never thought of before. And I love it when somebody kind of creatively takes an old truth and puts it in, in such words that it pops off the page. Listen to this. Christian thinking about salvation has divided itself into two main streams. Now, you might say, well, there's a lot of streams, but we're talking about a particular situation here. Into two main streams, which I like to think of as monkey-hold or cat-hold salvation. Anybody ever heard of that? I hadn't. 
Christian thinking about salvation has divided itself into two main streams, which I like to think of as monkey hold salvation or cat hold salvation. Now, listen to what the author says. The difference in theological viewpoint is seen in how monkeys and cats protect their young. A mother monkey will sound the alarm, danger lurks, danger lurks. The baby monkeys come running. And they run to her, and they hold tightly to her fur as she runs to safety. However, a mother cat, on the other hand, picks her kittens up by the nape of the neck and carries them in her mouth out of harm's way. Carries them. So which is it? Which is it? Monkey hold salvation or cat hold salvation? Does God sound the alarm in Jesus leaving us? to come running and hold on tightly? Think about that. Or does Christ take us by the nape of the neck and carry us to the throne of grace? When God sounds the alarm, does Jesus leave us to hold on, to run to Him and hold on tightly? Or does Christ take us by the nape of the neck and carry us to the throne of grace? And then they go on to write, at least in Jesus' parables, In other words, what does the Bible say? At least in Jesus' parables, it appears to be a cat hold salvation. Jesus pictures God as a shepherd who seeks out a lost lamb and carries it home on his shoulders. Or a homemaker who searches every corner of the house for one lost coin until she finds it and rejoices with her friends. Our salvation rests, he writes, in the care and keeping of a seeking Savior. I love that. The message is simple and clear, he concludes. We do not have to worry about holding on to God's coattails, for He will not let go of ours. Doesn't mean that we're not responsible, that we don't have anything to do, that we don't have a part to play. No. But we can rest, we can relax knowing I'm not God, and I don't have to be. I can resign as God of the universe. He makes me. He's in control. That letter E, immediately for me anyway, stands for the word eat. Rest, resign. But then E, eat. If you look to the text, it talks about green pastures and still waters. I heard a preacher say years ago, and I I know it wasn't original with him because I've heard it many times, and it's still a truth that I need to remember, and you do too. The Bible reminds us that the steps of a good person, a good man, are ordered of the Lord, ordered by God. I heard this pastor say, the steps are ordered and so are the stops. In other words, he guides us to where we need to be, but he also makes us lay down in green pastures and leads us beside still waters. Why is that important? Well, if you look to Scripture and you see the story of Elijah, a man who literally was suffering from from burnout. He was doing good, but he wasn't doing good. He was doing good. In other words, he had defeated the prophets of Baal. He had obeyed God, but then he ran from fear, collapsed under a, a juniper tree, and began to, in depression, lament his condition as if he were the only one serving God. It was all up to him. In other words, he hadn't resigned yet as God of the universe. And as he was doing good, it's obvious that he wasn't really doing good, though. The Bible talks about how that God ministered to him and God fed him. I remember reading years ago from a, an emergency room physician, how that in this major city where he worked, one of the things that they saw a lot was people dealing with depression. Anxiety is the number one mental health crisis in our time. And he talked about the people that would come in suffering from different symptoms, and maybe they were manifesting certain things that would cause you to say, well, this is their condition, this is their malady, but the the reality is that the underlying cause was depression. He talks about how that they would often give that person 
a steak dinner. And you say, well, what in the world does that have to do with a physical problem? Taking some, No, no. He said many times they were just simply lacking in protein and they needed something physically, chemically to help boost them back uh, and restore them a little bit so that their body could cooperate with their thinking and get them on the right road. The Bible talks about the fact that we have to resign as God of the universe, but also as a human being, as a man or a woman, a child, a young person. You are a physical human being. God placed you within a body. He created that body out of dust and breathed life into it. And He knows when that body gets to a place where it's run down, where its limitations are telling. And that's why He makes us lay down in green pastures and He feeds us in that green grass that a sheep would love to look at and love to taste of. Even those waters that are refreshment, refreshing to our soul, those are from God. But then we can also look at the letter S and see something very similar because it touches on the same text. Again, He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters or waters of rest. What, is that, what does that mean? You're talking about resigning as God of the universe and eating. These are just very natural things, pastor, very common things. The, the reality is that if He's our shepherd, then He's not just with us on the big days. He is with us on the common days and the ordinary days and the mundane days, which are most days. Listen to what Dale Ralph Davis writes in a wonderful book, Slogging Along in the Paths of Righteousness. And he writes this about verse 2, our text. All this is, we might say, the usual stuff a shepherd is to do. Picking up on what he's been talking about. What we might call the bread and butter sort of shepherd work. Bread and butter. The common things. The routine things. He provides for his flock's ordinary and ongoing needs. That says a lot. He provides for his flock's ordinary and ongoing needs. Isn't this where we as Christ sheep spend most of our time? Remember that. That's where we spend most of our time. Not on those super spiritual high moments or even in those horrible dark valley times. But in the Tuesdays and Thursdays of life, as Gordon Jensen wrote in one of his songs. Davis writes this, True, many of us face severe troubles. Maybe you're going through them right now. But much of the Christian life is not lived with soap opera tension, but in the realm of the ordinary and routine. I remember when a friend of mine was going through crisis after crisis after crisis, and I just was so concerned for him, and I, I said to my wife, I said to Susie, I said, you know, right now he is living his life in emergency mode. You can't do that forever. We weren't created to. And she said, that's exactly what he's doing. He's having to live his life in emergency mode. And it was wearing him out. But most of our life isn't lived there. Let me read that again. Many of us face severe troubles, but much of the Christian life is not lived in a soap opera tension, but in the realm of the ordinary and routine. And we simply get tired. Just kind of sigh with me. We simply get tired. And I love this. Listen to what he writes. We may not get run over. We simply get run down. Isn't that a great way to put it? We may not get run over. We simply get run down. We suffer from wear and tear, from spiritual exhaustion. We may not get zapped, he writes. We just get zapped. The ordinary things sap us of our strength, our vitality, our joy, and we need rest. A few sentences later, Davis concludes with this paragraph. We love him because he does not just meet us in the critical times, but in the common times. We know he will be at work for us on Tuesday and on the day after that, though there may be nothing dramatic about them. Psalm 68 and 19, he writes, captures it so nicely when it says, The Lord who daily bears us up. 
Isn't that what he does? The Lord Yahweh is my shepherd, and he daily bears me up. And he gives me something as simple as rest. The ability, the insight to resign as God of the universe. Let him lead. He makes me lie down. To eat in those green pastures that he provides and that still waters that he gives. To sleep. To sleep. And to rest in a way that it's hard to even put into words. And then finally, tea. And for me, the letter T stands for something very simple. It stands for the word trust. Because everything we are talking about could basically be a prescription from a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or a self-help book. Unless you factor in the fact that all of this is based on the fact that we can trust our God. We can trust the shepherd. He will not make us lie down where we're not safe. He will not provide something for our nourishment that is going to be for our destruction. He will not allow us to rest unless He Himself never sleeps and never slumbers. We can trust in Him. My brother years ago, and he's a wonderful, gifted musician as well as pastor and and singer and and songwriter. He wrote a song that... um, is so simple and so profound because it's basically a message of trusting Him. I don't know what you're going through this morning. I don't know what your week has been like. But are you trusting in the Lord? Are you really trusting? You're not resting because you're not trusting in Him. You're trusting in the news. You're trusting in the media or the alternative media. You're trusting in the statistics, you're trusting in science, whatever. Are you trusting in Him? Really? The words of that song go like this. When I was just a boy, I heard the thunder roaring in the sky, and it made me cry. My father held me close and brushed my tears away. With a gentle voice, I heard him say, Everything's going to be all right. Son, we'll make it through this night. Look, I see the morning light. Everything's going to be all right. Well, time has passed on by, and still I hear the thunder in the sky, and it makes me cry. But my Father up above reaches down in love and heals the pain, and I hear again. Everything's going to be all right. Son, we'll make it through this night. Look, I see the morning light. Everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to be all right. I love it when I see bloopers. In fact, probably one of my favorite forms of therapy is to watch news bloopers, Uh, Just life bloopers, things that happened that weren't supposed to. And um, I'm not talking about something that might hurt someone. I'm talking about when they can laugh about it too, you know, maybe after a little while. And um, I think I, I, I see myself in those. I remember my own bloopers, trip ups, slip ups, mess ups. And I remember watching a group that was going through some type of corporate coaching, building teamwork into the office place, and one of the things that they were teaching them to do was the trust fall. And someone had to stand elevated in the chair, everyone was behind that person, and they were to trust that group enough to fall into their arms. Trust their concern for their safety. That they would relax. They would go against the built-in fear factor and just let themselves go. 
And one person after another, you've seen on TV do this, but this particular person apparently hadn't seen this before. I don't know when it was taken, but you might have seen the video of this person when they're told, okay, fall, and everyone's waiting, and unbeknownst to them, because their eyes are closed, they're having to close their eyes and totally trust. They fall forward the wrong direction and, and hit hard. Um, what does a trust fall really mean? Well, in terms of this passage of Scripture that we've been talking about today, we understand that He's shepherd of my soul. And He knows the rest of the story. He knows how to help me rest. To resign as God of the universe because Yahweh, the shepherd's shepherd, is my shepherd. And He's a sheepologist. So he knows everything I need. He can take care of me. To eat. To sleep. To trust. And when I think of that, I think of that trust fall. How wonderful it would be tonight if you could trust fall to sleep in the arms of the shepherd knowing he's in control. Would you bow your head with me right now? We are living in troubling times. There was a time in this world where a fugitive would not go on the lamb, as they say, and try to live off the grid or try to change their identity or steal an identity. They would run to the desert. In these times that we're reading about, that was common. They would flee to the desert an unoccupied place where they didn't have to risk running into someone or being recognized, identified. And so the people that you might run into in these desert moments were not necessarily the best people. You had also animals, predators living in this desert land that would prey upon the sheep. I want to tell you something. We live in that time that is perilous, where we have a hard time recognizing the good guys from the bad times, but we do know that the enemy is against us. That Satan came to steal and to kill and to destroy. And that he wants to attack our mind and attack our bodies. And we need the message of Psalm 23 today. We need to know that the shepherd is with us. We don't have to Hold on to him as if that's all that's going to do it. And if I somehow lose my grip, I'm gone. We need to understand that he's in control. And not only does he love you, but he's got you. He's got you. And you can trust him. You need to understand and, and have faith in the fact that he's holding on to you. And you also need to understand that regardless of the predators, regardless of the fugitives, regardless of the demons from hell that might be out there trying to hurt us, we have a shepherd who leads us, who loves us, and who is with us. And I want us to pray this morning. And I want you to just speak the word rest. Rest. I'm not just talking about sleep. I'm talking about a rest that says I can trust fall to sleep in the arms of my Savior. I can trust fall in peace in the hand of Jesus. As we pray this morning, give it to God. Give it to God. Father, I bring this church family to you this morning. Satan has been attacking some homes. He's been targeting some individuals, some lives, some businesses. It seems like every week somebody has a testimony. Man, it's, it's, it's been tough. I've been under attack. But I'm also glad, Lord, that the other part of that testimony is about the shepherd. You. Yahweh, the shepherd, shepherd. 
And I pray in the name of Jesus that we would be able right now just to say, God, you're in control. I don't have to be. You know what's going to happen in the future. And you're the one leading me into it. You know what's going to happen tomorrow. And you're the one leading me into it. And so I trust you to pick out the places, to create the conditions. I resign. I give up the stress, the anxiety of trying to be what I was not created to be. And that's you. I was made in your image, but I was not made to be God. And so, Lord, I trust you. I rest in you. I will eat this afternoon in peace. I will sleep in confidence, knowing that the Lord is my shepherd. Yahweh is my shepherd. The shepherd shepherd is my shepherd. And he is a sheepologist. And he can handle whatever I face, whatever I go through. Knowing, Lord, that you are the one who knows the rest of the story. No matter what the news says, I can say to myself, and the rest of the story is, the Lord is my shepherd. I can resign. I can eat. I can sleep. I can trust in the goodness of God. Father, until we get that into our heads, until we get it into our hearts, we will become victims of this age and we will become pawns moved about on life's chessboard. Lord, that's not what you want for us. We are your sheep and you've got us and you will carry us. In Jesus' name we pray and in Jesus' name we profess. Amen and amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you for praying that with me. Thank you for trusting God. And right now before we do anything else, I just want to take a moment and pause. I want you to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. I'm going to lead you in that, and then, if you will, let's just close our eyes and reflect on that for a moment before we conclude the service. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still 